Alrighty, so my name is Kyle Harvey, and this week's presentation that I'm presenting is the environmental impacts and key traits of invasive species. So as a refresher from last week, this is right here is a northern snakehead. It's a uh, common invasive species native to our eastern Chesapeake Bay watershed and our local Maryland waterways. What makes this fish so um, invasive and dangerous to our waterways is, uh, one, it has this thing called a branchial artificial lung which has a really funny name to it, but just for now, we'll just call it an artificial lung. But what that allows it to do is it'll swim up into freshwater creeks where it's really low dissolved oxygen level water, and they'll be able to breathe in atmospheric oxygen to keep them alive and be able to lay their eggs in an area where no other fish will be able to swim because of the dissolved oxygen levels, ensuring that the most of their hatch will collect. Also, these uh, they're known to have parental care. So what that means is for about the first two months of these uh, new fish's lives, what you'll see is two adult fish swimming alongside, it looks like a pile of bait fish, or actually in the middle of them. What that is is their offspring. And for the first two months of life, they protect them and make sure that no other animals will eat them, which ensures the highest fecundity rate possible for them. Another thing that's dangerous is they can produce up to 50,000 eggs in one breeding season, which means in just two years, you can have up to 150,000 eggs per female in each waterway which is a huge amount. Um, an easy place where you can see an environmental impact is at the Crofton Pond in Maryland. Um, it was first subject and caught in Maryland. It was uh, caught about 10 years ago. So yeah, within five years after it was first caught, a thriving population was established. What a thriving population means it is naturally reproducing by itself and setting up its own spawning times. So within the first five years, after they went back and collected another sample, they came to find the snakehead uh, made up up to 25% of that lake's population, which shows in just five years, a uh, local population be affected up to like 25% of their local freshwater fish. All right, here's another fish from my last presentation. This is the grass carp. It was first introduced into the United States in 1963. Um, it was introduced to um, deal with the hydrilla incident, so it was an invasive plant species that was released into our uh, natural water systems to make more habitat for our fish, but it thrived too well and it extended out beyond. So they were introduced, but what happened was they started eating too much, and they did more than just the hydrilla. They started eating other natural local vegetation <coughs> that some fish need as their habitat to live. So a place that can be seen here is like in Lake Michigan. Um, grass carp here, they were released there to deal with hydrilla, but what they're doing now is they're starting to eat some local native uh, freshwater fish, not fish, I'm sorry, but plants. And what there is is there's a red-bellied red spotter, which is a type of fish that uses a certain type of vegetation for its habitat. And if this fish keeps going through and eating its natural habitat, it won't have anywhere else to live, and this fish could easily become extinct. Also, the reason this fish has become deadly is because it has also started up a naturally thriving population, which again, I'm going over in redundancy, but it means that there's an established population with established breeding seasons each year that they will follow. Alright, so a new species that I'm bringing in this time is the Burmese python. The uh, most common area that this is a problem in is in the Everglades in Florida. It is a uh, invasive species. The way it was released into Florida is people used to keep these as pets. And during Hurricane Katrina, what happened is people would evacuate their home, but they wouldn't take their pets with them. So during the damage and the storm, these animals got out of their cages and became part of the natural environment where they thrived well. Um, one reason they survived really well is that their natural environment looks quite a bit similar to the swamps of the Everglades, which means their natural camouflage will fit them perfectly here. Also, the size makes a difference here. Yes, there are alligators in Florida that can eat a uh, Burmese python, but once they get to a certain size, even alligators don't pose a threat to them. They've even been known to find alligators inside of the stomach of some Burmese pythons. Also, the reason it started coming into our problem is that they started eating off local people's dogs. So, a lot of people would release their dogs out in their backyard, they'd run around for the night, they'd come back the next morning, their dogs go. They find it about two weeks later inside the stomach of a Burmese python. So people had a lot of outcry and a lot of um, outbursts, which is why we're addressing the issue now. But another condition that makes it that it thrives in the Florida Everglades is the temperature. Florida is very unique in its humidity and its temperature setting. So 
and matches that quite easily of a tropical rainforest somewhat. So these, these tropical species of snake that used to having a high temperature climate, when they went to Florida, they had the exact same climate, which means they can thrive perfectly fine. Also, there's plenty of food items all throughout the Everglades, including local neighborhood dogs, as I said. It's actually one of their favorites. But a study was done in 2008 to 2012 that showed that the population, if it is not controlled and dealt with and managed properly, that their range could extend to one-third of the southern states of the United States, which is a huge range compared to just Florida. <coughs> and if they spread out, they can cause so many problems to the local environment that it could be detrimental to its, to its sustainability. All right, so that's all my slides. Did anybody have any questions about their, power, about their uh, handouts? Like any questions they didn't get to, anything they want me to go over? Um, it was just the artificial lung. There's a fancier name to it I was going to put down, but it just, okay. there's no way to remember it. Yes, ma'am. Do you know how they're dealing with Burmese pythons now? How they're dealing with them now? Well, they have a bunch of different methods going around, but for right now, there's a local game and fishery system and the local Burmese rescue. What they'll do is they'll go out into the wild and they'll try to catch as many pythons as possible without killing them humanely. What they'll do is they'll go around to exotic breeders throughout Florida or in the United States, call them, and they'll ask them, hey, do you have room for so many Burmese pythons, such and such and such. But if unfortunately if they're not able to find an owner that can take them, they will have to euthanize them. So they have been euthanizing the Burmese pythons in Florida. Any other questions? All right, thank you. Good job.